What do you make of David Favre's sighting of the Tic Tac UFO and other pilots who have uh, seen these objects that seem to defy the laws of physics? Well, I think you have to take them at their word. Um, Are they fascinating to you? These oh, absolutely. Reports? No, I know I know a lot of these people, right? So I, I know Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, the whole crowd I've been, I, I saw the videos about three weeks or so before they went public. I was um, at a bar with Lou <laughs> overlooking the Pentagon um, in Crystal City, and they showed them to me, and my hair stood on end. Wow. And he said, he said, this is, he said, this is coming out soon. And I, I know one of the guys on the inside who was the Naval Intelligence who had interviewed all of these pilots again before this came out. And it was hair-raising to hear this, uh, but also uh, exciting that, yeah. you know, here's not just people's testimony. These are credible individuals. And if you've seen the 60-minute episode with uh, some of the pilots, uh, you know, they have no monetary gain. If anything, they've got negative gain uh, from coming out. But then you also have all of the simultaneous uh, ship analysis from the USS Princeton and the radar analysis, et cetera. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just data. It's not a conclusion. Um, I'm, I'd be perfectly happy, honestly, perfectly happy if somebody sh showed that it was all a hoax. I can go back to my day job. <laughs> right. That could be a hoax, but other things might not be. I mean, the, right. this is the point. I, I mean, what this is why it's nice to remove some of the stigma about this topic because it's all just data and, mm -hmm. uh, and anomalous events are such that there's going to be, they're going to be rare in terms of how much data they represent, but we have to consider the full range of data to discover the things that actually represent something that's, um, if we pull at it, we'll discover right. something that's extraterrestrial or something deep about the phenomena uh, on Earth that we don't yet understand. Right. Well, if it only stimulates people, for instance, to think, okay, well, what happens if we could move like that with momentumless movement? And, and it stimulates young individuals to go into the sciences to ask those questions, that to me is fascinating. I mean, after I've been openly talking about this in the last year especially, I've had a number of uh, students from top schools who aren't my students come to me and say, if I can help, let me. How can I help? I never had thought about this before, but you opened, you and others, not just you and others, have opened my mind to thinking about this matter. Yeah, that's why it's actually funny that uh, uh, Elon Musk doesn't think too much about this. Uh, these kinds of propulsion systems that could defy the laws of physics as we currently understand them. To me, it's a powerful way to think. What well, what is possible? Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's inspiring. Even if some yes. of the data doesn't represent uh, uh, extraterrestrial vehicles, I think the the, the observation itself. It's like uh, something you mentioned which is uh, you know, hypothesizing, imagining these things, considering the possibility of these things, I think opens up your mind in a way that uh, ultimately can create the technology. First, right. you have to believe the technology is possible before you can create it. Right. In my own lab, you know, we always look for, as, as I've said before, what is inevitable and you know, saying inevitably this is the kind of data we need, but if we need that kind of data, the instrument we want isn't, doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay, so I imagine the perfect instrument, I can't make it, and you back into something which is practical, and then you, in a sense, reverse engineer the future mm -hmm. of what it is that you wanna make. And I've started and sold like at least half a dozen or more companies using that basic premise. And so it was always something that didn't exist today, but we imagined what we wanted. And at the time, many people said it couldn't be done. I mean, for instance, all the gene therapy that's done today with retroviruses came from a group meeting in David Baltimore's lab. I was a postdoc with him. And one of the other postdocs 
wasn't able to make retroviruses in a way that he wanted to. And I realized I had a cell line that would allow us to make retroviruses in two days rather than two months. And so he and I then worked together to make that system. And now all gene therapy with retroviruses is done using this basic approach mm -hmm. around the whole world because something couldn't be done and we wanted to do it better and we imagined the future. And so that's, I think, what the whole UFO phenomenon is doing for people. It's like, well, let's imagine a future where these kinds of technologies are, but also let's imagine a future where we don't blow ourselves up, right? So if these things are there, they manage to not blow themselves up. So it means that at least one other civilization got past the inflection point.